Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of an introduction to the art and science of Chinese tea ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 2, Chapter 8, Section 8, Looney or End Play. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny. Hey, hey. Zong Jun Li and Emily Wong. Hi. Hey. My first question. Looney seems to be one of the least understood or perhaps least discussed of the Zisha ores. What has been your experience, both past and recent, with Looney clay wares? I've had little to almost no experience with actual Looney wear. So I've only seen pictures of it. I've read it in books, but not the exact real thing. And I think it's because the ore itself is so rare. It is very different to the common reddish color that we are familiar with teapots. So oftentimes it can lead to a higher possibility of fake ones. So it's, for me, it's so a legendary kind of wear thing that I've never really seen in real life. I want to push back on that a little bit because consider even in the Tea Institute where we had access to antiques and rarity wasn't an issue. We had some very rare wares. We had no loony. The Institute didn't have a loony teapot. So it's something about more than rarity, right? Was it some type of cultural disinterest? We've talked about the gradients of rarity in the past. In theory, Looney is even more rare than Judy, but how rare is any of it, right? These teapots are available. We could go, we could purchase a Looney teapot now. Why didn't we do it when we had the resources in the Institute? That's a good question. I personally think that because of the color and the rarity, there could be a lot of counterfeits in the market. So it's harder for us to distinguish whether it's real or not. Pat, do you have a different take? Yeah, it, it wasn't the hotness, man. I I personally didn't use Looney my entire time at Penn State because we had no Looney teapots. And I did not personally purchase a Looney pot until this year. I own the same one that's pictured in the chapter that Jason and I and actually Zongjun all bought when we were in Yixing. I think it's just not popular because there's, I don't want to say that there's not any Historically interesting pieces, there are. There's some beautiful historical Looney famous pieces, both slightly more historical and, and contemporary. But I, I don't think there's been this romanticization of Looney that we see with many of the other clays. And Juni right now, I feel like we talked in, in the last kind of discussion, has been the hotness the last couple of years. I still don't feel like Looney has had its time, and I don't think it's coming particularly soon. I think it'll get there. And we have seen some Western vendors start to do a couple commissions of Looney and talk more about it. I think one of the things that holds it back is Looney's performance with Pu'er and with Oolong seems to be hit and miss. Some pots, depending on the firing and everything, are pretty great and some are so-so. And I feel like everyone on the Western end is just looking for pots for Pu'er and Oolong. And so Looney is just not what they're reaching for. It's not the supreme branded Crocs or anything right now. So maybe give it five or six years and we'll see if that changes. That's an interesting point. I feel like Looney has been probably one of the more, I don't know, mystified teapot out there compared to all the other clay types in the market. Because of the name Looney, people, especially regular consumers, they would always assume that the color is going to look green one way or another. Actually, I have a pretty recent experience with Looney by uh, walking into a tea shop in Chaozhou and asking for some teapot samples for me to see. Well, of course, looking for a Chaozhou teapot, but this guy has a array of neon green color teapots sitting on the shelf and uh, he's calling it Looney. But that's not what Luli looks like. They got the name from some shaded color from the original ore, not the firing color, not the end products color. But I guess a lot of the uh, consumers and also teapot manufacturers just take the name as a symbol of what the teapot needs to look like. That's a good point. It is more common to see fraudulent, artificially colored loony. On a similar note, when I was living in Florence, we had a rule that any gelato shop selling pistachio gelato was a bad gelato shop. It would inevitably be a nuclear glowing neon green and it was obviously artificially colored and artificially flavored. It's very difficult to create real pistachio flavor. 
And maybe the same type of warning needs to be on loony teapots, that the fired clay should not be neon green. It should not glow in the dark. That's an interesting one. Zongjin, you spend quite a bit of time with other advanced practitioners in mainland China. How frequently does someone pull out a loony teapot? How frequently does someone say, here's my prize teapot from you, and it, it's an antique loony piece? Actually, I've never experienced that in a tea session with any tea practitioners that I sit down with and drink serious tea. So that's very interesting. And people tend to, to a certain degree, blur the line between Luni and Duani because the color do look similar to certain degrees. Luni is categorized into broad variations, including cloudy head Luni, black ink Luni, and Lipini, in addition to the most common generic Luni. What's the major differentiation of these materials and would you be able to differentiate them or are they too similar? Talking about the last part there, if I did not see the ore, if I just saw the fired clay, I'm not really sure that I would be able to differentiate any of them. The black ink loony looks black and the jima loony has little speckles, like look like black sesame seeds. So you can visually tell them apart, right? Or is there, are there perhaps generic and cloudy head look too similar? The black ink black after firing? No. So that's what I'm saying is I feel like if I looked at the ore for any of these. Yeah, I might have an idea. But if I look at the fired clay, I, I have a feeling that they're all going to look like loony to me. And I'm not going to be able to tell you which one is which. Yeah, definitely going to have a hard time. For loony, the end color really changed by a lot, depending on the region and the firing temperature. You have some Baoshan Luri looking like a Hongni or a Juni even. And you have some Jiman Luni being fired into a kind of a Duanyi color, yellowish with some hues of a green color, but overall yellowish color. So I would say I would be having a very hard time differentiating them from other clay types. So we know that the color will vary across multiple wares, but particularly in Luni, depending on the mine site and the ore type and the firing temperature. And yet the scholarships, the literati made a point of differentiating these subtypes, whether the black gangs or the cloudy head. So what's driving that? It's not just color, right? There has to be some kind of other property that they've deemed as important in order to make this distinction, this variations. So I think Something that we see with a lot of the named varieties is slight blends with other clay. So I think the cloudy head Luni, it's like forming between layers of Zuni. There probably is some slight inclusion or blend of Zuni in some of that. I think you go on to say that like the Lipini is often found in adjacencies with Tian Qingmi. And so there's probably some slight, maybe not purposeful blending, but you're probably getting some perigenensis. And so there's probably inclusion of other clays, which might make those specific named Luni clays unique from each other. Usually these uh, inclusions or blendings might result in a slight green color hue in the ore or on the surface of the ore before it gets fired. So I think that's also perspective how this type of clay gets named in the first place. My understanding is it's predominantly textural properties that create these differentiations. Speaking of blending, when used as a blending clay, what attribute does Looney accentuate? Is there a traditional blending for Looney ore? Maybe not an intentional blending in many circumstances, but you know, a natural blending by the mother nature. So you see a lot of these Looney, especially Lipini adjacent to, for example, Tianqingni or some other type of Zuni, and all these tiny little speckles um, on the surface of a Tianqingni ore or Zuni ore. And a lot of these ceramic artists love that. They love how the end product being slightly speckled with some pear skins texture, and also just a good indicator of the original ore being a, a more natural, less processed ore. Luni generally has a pretty large grain size. So when blending with something that might be like a Juni that has quite a lot of shao or sand, small particle material, it could help to add quite a lot of strength and potentially help with any kind of breakage during firing. I think the sintering temperature for Luni is also quite different than a lot of the other Yixing clays, right? It is. It's a higher sintering temperature, starting around 1,200 to 230 
with variations above 1,250 degrees Celsius. So I guess in the blend overall, it would generally raise the average kind of simtering temperature needed for the clay, which could result in a higher fire than maybe what the other blended clays in that would normally be. You could end up with a less porous, denser ware that was more fired than it would normally be. The teapot that you mentioned, the one that me, you, and Zongjun all bought the same one, do you know if it's blended clay or cloudy head or black ink or lipini? We can ask the potter, but I have no idea. So it really is. We have evidence that it is hard to identify. Zongjun, you don't know? No, oh, we got to call him. <laughs> I don't know either. We'll just have to tell everyone that it's the rarest form of loony. It is not in my notes. So pure loony wares were relatively uncommon before the F1 era. What changed and could this be seen as a positive innovation? I guess one of the major reasons is just the high breakage rate and flaw rate that loony tend to display during firing. And back in the F1 era, part of the main goal is to essentially make money. You got to sell the teapot in a uh, caustic effective way. With such a high breakage rate and this clay has proven itself to be hard to work with. And I guess a lot of the master decided it's just not a good clay to continue working on for a lot of the production line. And also all of the uh, clays are mainly found in Huangshan region. So I guess gradually as the production in Huangshan decreases, we see fewer and fewer Luni. Shop mine number four and the larger shop mines during the F1 era increased production, right? So was Luni supplies falling or were they increasing because they became more common during the F1 era? I would guess increasing, but then at the same time, I think we see blending of Looney as a technology becoming more and more common. And so as we mentioned previously, we know that the pot we own is pure Looney, but we don't know what kind of Looney. Looney as a blending clay, or when you look at a Looney teapot, it's hard to even tell if it's been blended with something. So that blending technology, whether for better or for worse, is something that really came out of F1 and at least for making money. That blending was certainly a successful idea to implement for more structurally sound teapots. But I'd also say the fiery technology, moving from the, the dragon kilns and the downdraft kilns into the pushback kilns, uh, is really what allowed even pure loony wares to be consistently fired. That remained relatively uncommon in comparison to the increase in production of other Zisha clays. Yet before that, we saw very few, exceedingly few, pure loony wares. My last question, Emily, let's start with you. Were there any surprises for you in this chapter? Not really. For me, it was gaining more depth into this unknown category because it is a very uncommon type to see in the common marketplace and less talked of in the tea world. So for me, it was a lot of learning new knowledge. For me, I, I had heard of Lipini and Jimaluni, but I had not heard of the other types, rarer kind of subforms of Looney. And I really didn't know much about Looney at all. As I said, we, I didn't own a Looney teapot until this year. So a lot of the information in this was new to me. I don't know if there was anything that was like shocking. I think some of the firing flaws were interesting. And that was new information for me that the, the show up frequently for our Looney. I think maybe what what's the most shocking thing for me was that the picture of the teapot that both I and Zongjin and you own ended up in this chapter, which means you must not own a rare antique loony, Jason. I do not own an antique loony. Of the wares that I'm, I've been able to collect and find, I've not managed a pure antique loony teapot. Yeah, biggest upset of the book. That, that is some insightful collection tracking you got going on there. The most shocking thing to me, I guess, was uh, back when we were starting to do the research for this clay and just find out that not all Looney teapots are neon green. Confusing seeing the gradient of color that the Nuli can result into. It's uh, such a journey <laughs> to, to go down this rabbit hole, but uh, it has been a fun one. Speaking of which, I can't remember if you purchased the same teapot as Zongjun, but I have a, what's called a Jade Duani which is white with a green hue. And I have this loony, which is this straw pale tan color that looks like a duani. And then the white, white with a green hue looks like a loony, but it's actually duani. And this is, of course, loony. 
that's actually confusing because probably on the market, people will sell the, the Jade Hue 20 as a Luni for maybe a higher price. <laughs> Everyone, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for our next conversation, Duani or and Play. Mm -hmm.